Welcome everyone. Um, this is going to be a session on unpacking implicit bias in the prison industrial complex. Uh, we will go ahead and get started on how we can challenge our biases and redefine justice. And first, first, maybe a few, a few words about um, LSPC, our, our organization, and um, the work that we do. Um, I'm Eric Sapp. I'm a staff attorney. Um, I do uh, a mix of legal trainings, um, such as this, uh, technical assistance, which is when um, a QLSP or qualified legal services provider um, has specific um, questions, legal questions that they want research or advice on, and we work together to um, provide some counsel in that regard, um, and advocacy support, both in the policy space of um, trying to improve the uh, statutory and regulatory landscape, and um, selected impact litigation, which we do in partnership with QLSPs and other organizations. And uh, I'll kick it over to uh, Tanisha to introduce herself. Hello. My name is Tanisha Cannon, and I am the Managing Director with Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. As Eric mentioned, uh, some of the work that we do falls really under three pillars. Uh, one of those pillars is uh, legal advocacy, and that's the work that Eric explained. Um, the other work that we do is really around um, policy advocacy and how that impacts folks through the legislative process. And in order to do that, we organize people directly impacted in the communities to push policy in the legislation. Um, so that is the three pillars of the work that Legal Services for Prisoners does, uh, legal advocacy, uh, policy advocacy, and community organizing. And so uh, just a, a roadmap to, to this session um, before we get into the details. Um, so uh, the audience will be on mute throughout the proceedings, uh, but please um, feel encouraged to write um, questions and comments using the Q&A feature, uh, which should be accessible through your um, Zoom uh, platform. And uh, Yasalyn will uh, read out those um, where appropriate. And if we don't get to any of your questions or comments, um, feel free to email us. Um, by the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll put, make our emails available and we love your feedback and continue the discussion after the, after the, um, after the presentation. Uh, so we're gonna start with an overview of the prison industrial complex, which Tanisha is gonna um, explain the concept and the origins of, of this concept and the kind of impacts on communities and individuals that the prison industrial complex has. Um, then we're gonna talk about the concept of implicit bias and um, how to distinguish between explicit and implicit bias and how um, uh, incarceration status uh, intersects with other identities um, in terms of biases. And uh, Tanisha is gonna explain the concept of schemas and stigmas and how they operate uh, to construct uh, biases. Um, then I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, bias specifically in the legal context, um, less from a psychological perspective, but more from a um, law and society legal history perspective. I'm gonna talk about also about how um, uh, re-entry is a um, component of the prison industrial complex broadly construed. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about biases in attorney-client relationships. Um, then we're gonna um, discuss um, a, a sort of hypothetical scenario um, in which you can um, provide um, some reflections about how uh, biases may, may work in a concrete scenario. Then we're gonna try and take a, a test um, that some researchers, researchers at Harvard developed about um, implicit bias. Um, we'll invite people to take that test. You're not obligated to do so, of course. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for you to provide reflections about that experience in the Q&A function. Um, then I'm gonna talk about how anti-discrimination law intersects with the topics that we're talking about biases in the legal system. Um, then Tanisha is gonna talk about um, uh, some bias reducing strategies, and then we'll wrap up. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Tanisha. Thank you. So the prison industrial complex was an obscure term that was introduced by Mike Davis in an article um, called Hell Factories in the Field. 
This was in 1995. Folks were not using this term um, as it relates to activism and organizing. Uh, the overall term is a system where private companies and entities profit from running prisons. And this is often led through lobbying for harsher laws that lead to more people incarcerated. In 1995, social activists like Angela Davis, Dorsey Nunn, and Ruthie Gilmore really claimed and took and manifested this term prison industrial complex into a way that we could use it to discuss the racial disparities that were happening in prisons um, and really um, socialize the term so people can understand what it really meant. Um, and so when they took this term, they acknowledged how these institutions, that it's a network of institutions, and it wasn't just the prisons that were perpetuating this complex. So they recognized how the police, the court systems, um, even media played a, a huge role in um, the mass incarceration at this time. And some of the key components of prison industrial complex are uh, driven by profits. So it's profit driven, and it's really around uh, the racial inequities and disparities, as we could see uh, through historical context, how black, brown, and, brown and black bodies are often over-incarcerated and feed into this industrial complex. So to give a little bit background and historical um, timing of how the prison industrial complex came into place, it can go all the way back to 1865 during the 13th Amendment. Um, in the 13th Amendment, there's an exception clause. The 13th Amendment is around um, uh, slavery, which they name involuntary servitude. At that time, they say involuntary servitude is illegal except for punishment for a crime. This was in the 1800s. It manifested in ways that, uh, such as the Black Codes. In 1865, Black Codes were used to criminalize minor infractions to continue to perpetuate incarceration into the system. This was also convict leasing. In 1970s, we had a huge Nixon declares the war on drugs, which really set the groundwork for uh, punitive policies that related to uh, drugs. And then that manifested into the Sentencing Reform Act in 1884, where mandatory sentencing um, happened, where it's automatic mandatory sentencing, and it was given, all of that uh, was given to judicial discretion. Um, at that time, they were also abolishing uh, federal parole and increasing um, time for any drug offenses. In 1986, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act um, allowed for folks that were convicted of cocaine are selling crack versus co cocaine, they had huge uh, sentencing disparities. It was a hundred to one sentencing disparity when we know that um, cocaine was more prevalent in wealthier communities where crack was more prevalent in uh, less wealthy communities. And um, so that also manifested into the Clinton in 1994, Clinton introduced this Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, and that was um, uh, increasing penalties such as three strikes, um, introducing more uh, harsher death penalties and long-term sentences. In 2008, or in, in 1996, there was a big push around denying um, access to federal benefits such as welfare or even um, funding for schooling if uh, folks were convicted of any drug-related crime. This really increased uh, the prison population and really fed into the mass incarceration. As we could see now, today, we're coming back 30, 30 years later, there's these harsh on crime penalties, um, the repeal of propositions like 47, which just has recently happened, and California actually most recently deciding to vote against um, rectifying or amending the 13th Amendment to remove the language that uh, has an exception clause, which allows for 
involuntary servitude to continue in the prisons. So when we look at this timeline and we try to understand, we know that there are biases that are within these policies. And some of these biases may manifest through racial bias, confirmation bias, but there's also some very implicit bias here too. And we'll get to um, understand the difference between those. So when we do uh, discuss the types of biases that um, we all may have, uh, racial bias is very uh, prevalent inside of some of these laws, especially when you discuss the um, ratio of the crack to cocaine. This was obvious that there was drug problems that were happening all over, but they were really um, enforcing these drug wars in communities of color. Um, and confirmation bias is also um, brought through some other institutions such as the media. During this time, there was a big push around um, super predators and the media was really feeding into this confirmation bias that these young black men were super predators and needed to be incarcerated. So when we start thinking about how these racial biases and these confirmation biases can manifest into other biases, that start to include bias around incarceration and actual conviction status, then we have to ourselves make a uh, mindful decision around our biases and if they're explicit or implicit. So what is an explicit bias and what is an implicit bias? An explicit bias is a conscious um, preference. You decide, you say that, you know, you believe that black people are dangerous and it is an open expression. You refuse to let your kids hang out with um, Black people. A more implicit bias is an automatic reaction that you may have um, that will say that you don't believe maybe Black people are educated, so therefore you won't let your kids hang out with them. And this is something that's unconscious. So it's an attitude that's unconscious based off of stereotypes or judgments or based off of specific characters that relate to race, age or gender or even social economic status. And this ultimately influences your behavior and the decisions that you make and you have no awareness and control. It's an automatic reaction. When we start to think of how this does manifest and what are the mechanism, mechanisms of implicit bias, we have to understand uh, what stigmas we have and what schemas that we have. So stigmas are based off of uh, categories that you have and their negative understandings of particular categories that can relate to race or age. When you start to think of what a schema is, Schemas are what we have in our mind to help us with our mental framework to help us automatically categorize things. So schemas are important for us because at times we're often having 11 billion bits of information coming into us. So we have to be able to categorize those because the human brain can only actually consume about 40 bits of information at a time. So if you, for an example, if you see a chair, instead of trying to recognize where the chair came from, how the chair was made, you have categorized this as a place that you sit. So you know this to be a chair, you know that you've seen other chairs, maybe you haven't seen this particular chair, but you know the purpose of the chair and what it's used for. Instead of using 11 billion bits of information to try to understand that this is a chair, you automatically categorize it as a place that you sit without having to think additionally. So in terms of uh, schemas and how they relate to people, you can be walking across the street and automatically unconsciously make decisions about who you believe this person is. Are they safe? Can I walk on the same side of the street as them? Will any harm come to me? Your mind will automatically help you filter this information and it also allows you to categorize new information based on your past experiences. And you internalize this through your own thought processes and your perceptions. 
So when you start to think of how um, this uh, implicit bias develops, you can start to think of uh, ways that you have already categorized people with uh, that have been incarcerated or have conviction histories. You already have through these institutions, through media, through policies, through legislation, you have already created schemas around what you believe that these folks may be. So you have to make a conscious decision to understand what your preconceived notions are about these folks. And that's the way that you can work toward understanding how it develops. When we start to think about how implicit bias in the prison system has manifested, we can go back to this timeline around uh, racial profiling. Um, at the During that time, we have issues like broken windows theory. The broken windows theory was a way that um, officers used their preconceived notions in order to over police communities. If the windows are broken, if it's uh, if there's graffiti there, if there are people that are um, conjugating, then this can be an area where there may be high crime. So the, these areas were automatically profiled and people they're stop and frisk issues. So all of these policies are manifesting based off of implicit bias. When we start to go back to discriminatory sentencing practices, um, we can think of Oh, if the three strikes law, if this person has been convicted before, yeah, they're more likely to reconvict. So with these three strikes laws, we're going to include um, more timing or we are going to offer mandatory or give them mandatory sentencing and remove some of that discretion. Um, when we think about how our prisons are over uh, crowded, we think about the disparities and we can make um, logical, objective uh, decisions to see that the nation has 14% uh, Black people. But when you look at our prison systems, you see that they're overwhelmingly 40% Black. Um, and that's in comparison to their counterparts, where white people make up 65% of the nation and 39% of folks that are incarcerated. So there's obvious racial um, disparities inside of our prison system. When we start to think about the reason why um, prisons exist, especially in California, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations is meant to uh, be a place where we ensure that folks that are going into prison can get the rehabilitation that they need. The whole reason why the CDCR added the R to their um, name was to ensure that folks that were going to prison, we'd be able to take care of these issues. So if they are going to jail because of drugs, should they be in there taking more drug rehabilitation classes? Should they have um, more behavioral health classes? Or are we in there for punishment? And you can see that the state of California, most recently voting against the Proposition 6, believes that prison should be a place for punishment opposed to a place for rehabilitation. So now we have to start thinking about what makes us believe these things. And we have to go back historically and we have to be conscious about the way that we think about people with incarceration uh, history and past. I will pass it on to Eric who will talk a little more about implicit bias in the legal context. Uh, thank you very much. So um, on, on, on the question, um, a, a brief word about the um, prison industrial complex um, concept. So it was modeled off of the famous um, concept of the military industrial complex that uh, President Eisenhower in the farewell address um, in 1961 uh, included sort of almost in passing in that speech, although it, it, it's the most remembered part of that speech where uh, Eisenhower was saying how because of the Cold War armaments, a permanent arm, armament um, and, and uh, military capacity of the nation was essential. 
Uh, but the power of the arms industry um, was such that it could be disastrous if the if undue influence um, on um, government decisions were were created by were were, were um, conducted by the arms industry. Um, and subsequent scholars and activists um, took over the military industrial complex um, concept and extended it into the variety of ways in which militarization affects a society's political culture um, and um, really social welfare when um, resources are diverted away from uh, education, health, um, and, and similar um, welfare-related projects and into the arms industry. Um, now, uh, similarly, the prison industrial complex um, uh, functions uh, uh, analogously in the context of carceral power. So, um, you know, the building of prisons rather than schools, um, the uh, school to prison pipeline, um, and all the ways that um, state resources are used in the carceral system, but also um, ways in which private industry, um, whether it be um, private detention facilities, um, uh, whether it be the manufacturers of ankle bracelets um, and, and the like, um, uh, you know, bail bonds companies and so forth profit off of the system of carceral power, which is which is bigger than um, prisons in the narrow sense. It includes also, of course, jails, um, uh, probation, supervision, and um, the various ways that the criminal injustice system um, impacts people's lives. Um, now, one of those um, ways is, um, uh, you know, the, the post-conviction and post-release consequences um, under understood under the rubric of re-entry, where um, the employment and housing uh, prospects and opportunities for persons who have been incarcerated uh, uh, tend to be reduced relative to uh, the rest of the population. Um, and at the same time, there is a whole, um, uh, private industry of background check companies, which um, sort of exploit the fears that the public and prospective employers and housing providers uh, may have. Um, you know, there are, of course, legitimate safety concerns, and then there are, of course, exaggerated um, safety concerns that aren't borne out by um, statistical evidence. And um, often uh, what's driving the um, background check industry um, seems to be the latter rather than the former. Um, so um, my first um, sort of um, argumentative point is that the prison industrial complex considered as a total network of carceral power includes the economy of re-entry. And associated with that is a practical maxim, um, which I would uh, phrase as the following. Uh, don't assume there is an outside to the prison industrial complex or to the network of carceral power. Um, we are all, in a certain sense, within a system marked by mass incarceration and um, policing power broadly construed. Um, bias, bias is, um, my, my second argumentative point is that bias is a design feature as well as a defect um, of an instrument or action that gives it a tendency to proceed in a non-neutral way relative to some assumed ideal. Bias is not a um, external uh, pathology that uh, besets law from without, rather inequalities and inequities are built into the very foundations of the law. Um, there's a, a famous quote by the French writer uh, Anatoly France from the turn of the 20th century, um, uh, commenting on the French idea of equality um, before the law. And you know, he, he and that line goes to the effect: uh, the rich and the poor are alike banned from sleeping beneath the bridges. Um, so you have a, a neutral law; um, no one is allowed to sleep underneath the bridges, and it of course has an unequal impact on different classes of the population. Um, a, a word about the etymology of the concept of bias. Um, interestingly, it, it, along with 
Some other familiar uh, metaphors um, originates in a sporting and gaming context. So we're all familiar with the idea of the absence of a level playing field as one of the um, ways of thinking of, of a non-impartial system or the concept of loaded dice in a gaming context. Um, bias is, is one of these types of metaphors. Um, so it was used in English most prominently in the um, 16th century in relation to the game of lawn bowling. Uh, lawn bowling is akin to um, bocce ball, where you you know roll a, a series of balls um, along a, a path. In in, the, in this case, a, a, a grass um, field, and because the shape of the ball is not perfectly round, it is a spheroid where one side is heavier than the other. It naturally makes the the ball um, move in a curved fashion in a in, in an inclination to one side. And that was called a bias. And then that was taken over um, in uh, the discourse of law and of um, um, society and psychology generally to describe a, a tendency to um, proceed in a, um, in a way that is oblique to a um, perceived straight path. Um, so my, my, my second, um, uh, sort of uh, suggested um, recommendation for, for thinking through bias in relation to the nature of law is that in checking for defects of bias, uh, don't ignore the design features of the um, legal regime that you're investigating. And furthermore, uh, do, do not forget to check the presumed ideal uh, for its own biases. Uh, and um, this is not something that can ever be um, accomplished once and for all because law is the object of a perpetual uh, conflict over its meaning and its uses. Um, in Business and Professions Code, um, uh, California Business and Professions Code um, section 6001.3, um, there's a declaration of legislative intent of the California legislature, um, which uh, pertains to um, the need to enhance access, fairness, and diversity in the legal profession um, and uh, the elimination of bias in the practice of law. And this is the one of the several um, legal bases for the MCLE uh, requirements regarding elimination of bias. And in section um, 6001.3b, um, uh, paragraph one, um, it says the legislature finds and declares the following. The rich diversity of the people of California requires a justice system that is equally accessible and free of bias and free of bias and is a core value of the legal profession. Um, so the ideal of being free of bias is, is stated as the goal of the legislature. Um, I, I think one of the, the challenges of the notion of implicit bias is um, that it may um, be an impossible goal to achieve. Um, but one that nevertheless, whether it's um, feasible or not, should nevertheless be um, something that we try to bring to our awareness um, whenever we can. Um, in terms of the um, other findings of the legislature in the Business and Professions Code regarding the practice of law, in um, 6210, um, this, this was added in 1981 uh, at the same time that the IOLTA scheme that created um, the state's um, current um, system of, uh, you know, qualified legal services providers and support centers. Um, I, I imagine some people on this call, um, you know, work for um, uh, one or the other of those um, types of entities. Um, in 6210, the legislature finds that due to insufficient funding, existing programs providing free legal services in civil matters to indigent persons especially underserved client groups such as the elderly, the disabled, juveniles, and not English speaking persons do not adequately meet the needs of these persons. And then it, and then it goes on. Um, that was of course, 40 years ago, um, over 40 years ago. Um, and um, I think that's remains true today. And we should um, uh, take seriously, not as a um, something that's, you know, um, just a matter of course, but something that is officially recognized in the law, um, and yet the law um, 
sort of um, is able to tolerate um, it um, for so long, um, which is that um, whole segments of the population do not have adequate protection of their civil rights and uh, legal protection of their needs. That is to say, the um, inherent um, inequalities of the legal system are um, endemic and last for um, as long as we can remember. Um, before I pass the mic um, back over to Tanisha, I wanna say a little bit about the um, attorney-client um, relationship um, and specifically how, um, of course, everyone who works as an attorney uh, providing legal services um, to the indigent um, is you know, committed to using law in order to help um, people. And of course, um, those also doing um, uh, you know, criminal defense as public defenders or family defense um, are you know, using the law as best they can to, to help people. But we also should think of the extent to which the attorney-client relationship itself is part of a uh, can be a part of processes of subjection, um, and this is this is a, a point that was um, most poignantly um, called to my attention by um, a uh, uh, now retired um, colleague of ours at Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, Hamdia Cooks Abdullah, who points out that uh, some of the meaning, the very meanings of the word client in the in the legal in the ubiquitous legal concept of, of a client uh, can encode a certain um, kind of bias, um, uh, you know, in the very language used to describe these relationships. So one of the traditional um, origins of the, the term client is a Roman relationship, ancient, in the ancient Rome, a relationship between a uh, plebeian and a patr patrician to um, social classes um, uh, in an unequal relationship where a plebeian is taken under the protection of a pat patrician who is their patron and the, um, the poor person in that relationship is the client. And um, the, the etymology of client is um, to incline, to lean um, toward um, someone or something. Um, and so there's a kind of connotation of dependency um, built into that uh, word. Now, of course, over the years, the, the term has had many different uses and many different senses, and I would definitely not recommend that um, people discard um, using that term in their practice because it is a technical legal term and has um, significant implications in terms of invocations of attorney-client privilege, um, and, as well as the duties attending to an attorney-client relationship. But nevertheless, it's worth um, reflecting on um, how um, um, you know language itself kind of encodes uh, a complex history of power relations. So my um, uh, suggestion is that um, as attorneys and as persons working in the legal field, uh, we should try to be conscious of the ways that legal representation um, can both be empowering and repressive, and sometimes both at the same time. And I will uh, pass the mic back to Tanisha. Thank you, Eric. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, language is powerful. And even some of the work that we've recently done with Legal Services for Prisoners with Children was ensuring that um, incarcerated folks were not referred to as inmates because it does um, not encapture the full being of who they are. And just recently, uh, California Department of Corrections has changed that language from inmate to incarcerated uh, persons. Uh, so it's very important to you know, understand the way that we even um, describe people because that can help develop uh, the way that we socialize and stereotype people um, through society, through media, and just this internalized messaging um, so, yes, reflection is needed um, when we start to describe uh, people and, and who they are and what they encompass, because 
incarcerated, people are more than an inmate. They're mothers, they're fathers, um, they're people who are loved by others. So um, it's important to understand the way that we use language and, and we internalize it because that goes toward our confirmation bias and toward our implicit bias. Um, and as we know, bias shapes our world, not just our justice systems, it's shaping all of our world. Um, and so I wanted, we wanted to just bring in a real life scenario to discuss how uh, bias can um, show up in legal context when it, um, in relation to um, attorney um, and, um, and the folks that they're working with. Uh, so here's the scenario, um, and I want you to just kind of reflect as I read through this scenario, reflect on um, ways that implicit bias is showing up and ways that we could identify it. Um, a Black client named James is charged with a minor drug possession offense. During an initial meeting, his attorney, who is unaware of her own implicit biases, makes subtle assumptions about James based on his race and appearance. Without asking about his background or any personal mitigating factors, she assumes that he's from a low-income neighborhood, has limited education, and may not fully understand the legal process. Take some time to reflect and think about how this might affect the way that she communicates and strategizes for his case. And if you like, you can um, drop anything in the chat that comes to your mind around how this may affect the way that she communicates and strategizes for his case. I'll give it a second if folks want to think about how James' attorney may be affected by implicit bias, assuming um, that he doesn't have education based off of his appearance or that he doesn't have money based on his background. Do you want to re maybe read this area one more time in case yes. folks have had difficulty hearing? Or... Sure. A Black client named James is charged with a minor drug possession. During an initial meeting, his attorney, who is unaware of her own implicit biases, makes subtle assumptions about James based on his race and appearance without asking about his background or any personal mitigating factors. She assumes that he's from a low-income neighborhood, has limited education, and may not fully understand the legal process. Yeah, she won't work for as hard for him because he can't pay. That is one. Yes. Thank you. So rather than exploring alternatives like a diversion program or contesting the evidence, she quickly advises him to accept a plea deal. She believes it will be easier for him and that he may struggle with the demands of a more extensive legal process. The attorney also speaks to him in an overly simplified terms, assuming that he won't grasp the legal concepts, even though James is college ed educated and has no prior record. She might not inform him of alternatives, exactly. She may not take the time to explain the factors because she thinks he can't comprehend. Absolutely. So these are all ways that it can manifest. Um, so rather than exploring the alternatives, yes, she just assumes that he won't grasp it and he can't comprehend. So James now, now we think about the way that it's impacting James and not just the attorney, right? Not what she's doing. So James now senses that the attorney's assumptions, um, senses these assumptions, and he begins to lose confidence in her. Now that he loses confidence, he's feeling that she isn't fully invested in his case. This will affect his willingness to share details that could be valuable to his defense. He also becomes hesitant to even ask questions or request alternative strategies. He's in fear that his attorney may not even consider his views valuable or realistic. So now at this point, these assumptions may lead the attorney to recommend less favorable um, options. Now James is not opening up and giving uh, very specific details that may help with this case. And now this implicit bias has manifested 
to, um, you know, making James think that his only option is to take this plea deal. And we have seen historically that this is the way that plea deals have played out um, and perpetuated this mass incarceration. In a different setting, with an attorney who engages without biases, James might have been able to explore alternatives to a plea deal, like the dismissal of charges based on the lack of evidence, or participate in a community service program or a diversion program. But instead, the implicit bias in this situation led straight to the plea deal that could have been avoided. Now this impacts his records and opportunities for housing. Now that James has this conviction history, it has added this extra layer of a stereotype. And now James will have to deal with these 48,000 consequences even after he's released. Um, so implicit bias can have these long-term um, consequences that will manifest throughout his whole life because of an implicit bias in a legal um, matter. Okay, and if you'd like to unmute yourself or use the chat, then you're able to do that. Um, so with that being said, this scenario, we would like to have folks kind of think about ways that maybe implicit bias has shown up for you. Um, and we actually have a self-assessment tool, as Eric mentioned, uh, Harvard came up with this assessment tool that allows people to test their biases. Um, in this tool, I'm going to drop the link in the chat for folks. And we're gonna ask for you to take about 10 minutes to complete uh, this implicit bias um, self-assessment tool. When you log on to it, you have options of different scenarios um, to take check your implicit bias. For this particular class and section, we're going to ask you to select the uh, race implicit bias. And then you'll just continue here. So you'll have 10 minutes to complete that. Um, and then we'll come back and, and, and discuss a little bit uh, more about the scenario and about the implicit bias. Uh, it's 12.43, so we'll give you until 12.53 to complete that. Um, again, I think it we is... could do 15. Uh, okay. I, I think we could do 15. We're, we're running good, good, good on time, so. Okay, great. I'll just play a little bit of music while you complete your test. If you have any questions, you could continue to update them in the chat. Um, if you have any comments or reflections, please feel free to do that as well. Thank you. 
we're for the ones who pay attention to every little detail. The ones who fuss. Okay, we'll be coming back here in about a minute. I do see a question in the chat. Um, and I've also added some reflection questions that we can uh, kind of share and, and, and walk through if you like. Uh, but I'll start with this question that says, can you discuss our own role as legal aid, nonprofit adjacent workers, including how implicit bias impacts our own nonprofit industrial complex. How does it impact our own nonprofit industrial complex? So I think this um, I think this question is is a good one and um, relates to um, the point that I was making earlier about how the attorney client relationship can be um, a mechanism uh, not only for empowering the client, but sometimes for um, at the, the attorney serving as a conduit for the continued repression of the client um, and being attentive to that as an ever present danger of that relationship is an important um sort of first step uh, for addressing it um and, and we'll say a little bit more about some other um techniques of um mitigating bias uh, I, I won't go as far as the business and professions code and speak of eliminating bias because i don't think that's possible but i think it's something to, to, to look into um it you know the, the question also talks about the nonprofit industrial complex that's an interesting um formulation so so i would say that um, in a certain sense, 
um, the, you know, the, the legal aid uh, community is as, you know, officers of the court and as um, part of the overall system are in a, a very ambivalent relationship, often um, being um, uh, taking a, a realist approach and um, having a strong measure of skepticism toward the formal law, but at the same time, recognizing that um, if the, if if we don't use the law to, to try and um, um, protect persons from the damage that the system does, um, uh, they, they may not have um, anywhere else to turn and and it may be um, unavoidable to um, to 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 you know try to use the law for justice even though we're aware that it it has its own um, limitations. Um, other um, thoughts about um, this test that we just took um, or um, other, um, you know, any um, reflections about that? Yeah, particularly around like, how do you see schema show up during your assessment? Um, I know this test was really based on timing and making like your initial decision soon. Um, so how do folks feel about the way that they may have felt under pressure because of timing to get it done that their schemas then showed up? In our nonprofit worlds, in our legal worlds, I know that they're, um, we're, we're often at capacity. So sometimes being able to take that step back and reflect doesn't feel like there's always that option. So I think that it's it's very important that we create that time for self-reflection, acknowledge what we're thinking. Um, and yeah, timing is not a good way to calculate implicit bias that yes, I, I, I do. Uh, it's one of the uh, factors that can be calculated and particularly when I think in our industries, because of our capacity that we're often using our um, confirmation bias um, just to move through something that we think that we already know. Um, sometimes it's hard to listen to, to hear or learn what you already know. Um, definitely external factors have to be considered. Uh, policies need to be considered. And I think to answer that other question around the uh, nonprofit industrial complex is when you do recognize something that does need to be changed, I think advocating for that um, advocacy is very important, even if it's not your particular role, um, but it's important for us to advocate. As we look back at the timeline, these are laws that have been written with legislative intent that may have had implicit bias. So I think it's our job and our duty to, to try to recognize some of the intent in a lot of the legislation, um, some of the intent in these uh, the legal terms and recognize where the bias is showing up. Um, another strategy for like recognizing um, implicit bias can be just taking the time to reflect. You'll, after this um, webinar, you'll get access to a lot of materials, but there's a reflection exercise that's in there, or maybe you just can sit down and write, like, what is my existing knowledge? You can take a, a, a certain concept where you believe maybe implicit bias may be showing up, and you can just jot down, like, what is my knowledge already? What is my existing knowledge? What is my existing belief? Um, what feelings do I have around this? What positive feelings? What negative feelings? What emotions do I have? And then when you calculate all of those uh, pre-existing um, beliefs and, and thoughts and feelings, then you can recognize, okay, so now what are ways that I could disempower this bias? But if you don't recognize it, then you can't disempower it. So I think that the the main thing is acknowledging that these biases do exist. 
And then when we think about implicit bias, we're often thinking about age, we're thinking about gender, we're thinking about race. But there are so many other groups that you can bring into this fold to recognize that we are having implicit biases around um, different groups. And particularly for this webinar, uh, groups as it relates to uh, people who have been formerly incarcerated or are currently incarcerated. And um, Eric will speak more to that group of folks that we have these implicit biases around that we may not even be acknowledging. So that's a, um, a good segue to discuss um, how anti-discrimination law, um, specifically California anti-discrimination law, um, interacts with um, the questions of biases that we've been um, talking about. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, both um, look at what, what I'll, for these purposes, call a traditional anti-discrimination law approaches that are encoded in the UNRU Civil Rights Act um, of the Civil Code and in the Fair Employment and Housing Act provisions of the Government Code. Um, and then um, compare and contrast that with the uh, focus on arrest and conviction history that we see as an emerging um, trend, uh, both in the government code and um, a little longer than that in the labor code. Um, both of these, you know, with a focus on their importance for um, reentry uh, specifically. Um, and more broadly for um, system involvement. So in um, the civil code, uh, section 51, um, known as the Unruh Civil Rights Act, I'm obviously not gonna read the whole thing. Um, it is um, it contained in your um, handout material. So I do encourage folks after this talk to, to look at the statutes in more detail that I'm gonna mention very briefly. Um, now, um, so uh, 51 of the, Civil code um, covers um, access to um, accommodation in all business establishments um, uh, whatsoever. Um, and that uh, provision 51 uh, subdivision B says that all persons within the jurisdiction of the state are free and equal. And no matter what their sex, race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, disability, medical condition, genetic information, marital status, sexual orientation, citizenship, primary language or immigration status are entitled to the full and equal accommodations, advantages, facilities, privileges, or services in all business establishments of every kind whatsoever. Um, and so this is sort of, you, you could say, um, when someone is a, is a customer or recipient of, of services in, in public accommodations, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, which includes private businesses as well as um, state facilities. Um, Turning to the government code, um, we have an anti-discrimination um, principle regarding employment in government code um, 12940, um, which says it is unlawful an, an unlawful employment practice unless based on a bona fide occupational qualification or except uh, where based on applicable security regulations established uh, by the United States or the state of California for an employer because of the race, religious creed, color, national origin, ancestry, physical disability, mental disability, reproductive health, decision-making, medical condition, genetic information, marital status, sex, gender, gender identity, gender expression, age, sexual orientation, or veteran or military status of any person, comma, to refuse to hire or employ the person or to refuse to select the person for a training program leading to employment or to bar or to discourage the person from employment, or from a training program leading to employment or to discriminate against the person in compensation or in terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. Now, the list um, in 12940 is a little longer than in, um, un in the UNRU Civil Rights Act, but it's um, uh, similar. Um, and um, in both cases, um, arrest or conviction history um, or other status of criminal justice system involvement is not one of the enumerated categories. Um, I won't read it, but um, 12955 of the government code um, has uh, a similar um, a, uh, housing discrimination, anti-discrimination principle. Um, and um, 
again, has the same feature of, of enumerating um, various categories um, and arrest or conviction history is not one of them. Now, you, one can use, um, uh, one can, can um, you know, um, recognize that uh, arrest or conviction history can be a, um, a proxy for uh, discrimination on one of these other enumerated bases, such as, for example, race. If, if one could show um, a that uh, racial discrimination was done by proxy through um, arrest or conviction history, you could argue that there is a violation of the government code um, when an employer refuses um, to uh, arrest someone based on uh, sorry, uh, refuses to hire someone or, um, you know, uh, refuses to promote them, et cetera, um, or gives them um, less favorable conditions of employment based on um, their system of involvement status. Uh, but that's a difficult, very difficult claim to make. Accordingly, um, a approach that directly um, pertains to uh, system involvement um, began to be pursued um, in the 2000s. Um, so currently the labor code um, 432.7 addresses arrests and um, dismissals. Um, and in the government code 12952 has to do with employment. And, and this is specifically in the employment context of these, uh, th these statutes that I'm talking about right now. Um, uh, government code 12952 the fair chance act uh, uh passed in in 2017 uh uh doesn't prohibit discrimination based on arrest or conviction history but establishes a um set of restrictions on um the employment application and recruitment process and limits background checks to after a conditional offer of employment is made. Um, and so under 12952, um, it's an unlawful employment practice for an employer with five or more employees um, to, among other things, to inquire or to consider the conviction history of the applicant, including any inquiry about conviction history on an employment application until after the employer has made a conditional offer of employment to the applicant. Now, under existing law, once the conditional offer is made, um, background checks can um, be can be done, although there are there have been efforts um, that have not yet been successful in the legislature to um, restrain um, the use of background checks even after a conditional offer um, um, a lot further and to make it a genuine anti-discrimination law where arrest and conviction history um, would be a, a a protected category against discrimination, but that is not the um, the current law as it exists. Um, so, um, some 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 takeaways, uh, and I'd also invite you to to take a look at the um, um, handout materials, not just for the statute, but also for the articles that we um, uh, included, including some um, interesting articles. Um, uh, by um, Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw about um, um, critical race theory and intersectionality concepts. Um, we, we, we can say, you know, intersectionality is everywhere, but the functioning is um, complex and has to do with the specific um, categories that um, the multidimensional experience um, that people have in the social structure um, results in. So a uh, practical maxim is to be attentive to complex effects and unintended consequences. Anti-discrimination law cuts to the core of the problem of justice as drawing distinctions and enforcing differences is one side of the classic definition of justice. In the common law tradition, there's a famous um, statement um, which you know was expressed by many um, judges, including um, uh, Cook in the um, turn of the 17th century and um, Lord Hoffman in um, our own era, um, which is um, sort of a banality, as Hoffman stated, but an important one, which is treat like cases alike 
and unlike cases differently. And the trick is knowing when a difference is such as to um, justify uh, treating um, uh, treating an unlike case as an unlike case. So the challenge is knowing and um, proving what differences matter and when and how the protections and exposures of the law operate. Um, and I will um, pass the mic back over to Tanisha. Thank you. So as we recognize that implicit bias um, does exist, although it is unconscious, we talk about ways that we can be more conscious to recognize when it is showing up. Um, and so we do have a very lovely handout that is also included um, in the materials that you'll receive that give you ways that you can mitigate some of the uh, harms of implicit bias. Uh, like Eric mentioned, it you can't just get rid of it. It will be there. Um, it's an unconscious thing, but we could work toward um, making some of the unconscious more conscious when we we are reflecting. Um, so some of those best practices include that self-reflection, -re acknowledging um, having ongoing education. Uh, LAAC LAC um, will be having multiple series around uh, implicit bias. So continuing that education, um, also taking some like mindful approaches, taking those steps to really acknowledge after if you have a case take some time to be really mindful and think through things. Um, how is your structured decision-making process going? Uh, do you have a structured decision-making process? Is it um, standard for folks? Like in the case in the scenario um, that we made around James, was there a standard process to offer a plea deal and offer other alternatives? Or did that attorney just go straight to the plea deal? So if you create some standard protocols and guidelines and checklists, that will help you acknowledge if you are um, having an implicit bias. Um, also, if you if you focus on um, objectives and, and, and collecting data, um, then you can acknowledge that some of the um, decisions that you are making are not subjective based off of your implicit bias. So having some like real data-driven um, ways that you can acknowledge your potential biases. And overall, how, having like an accountability uh, mechanisms. Do you have uh, peers that can review your case and, and give a second eye and look it over? Um, so just hold some accountability uh, to your cases and, and when you're dealing with your um, the folks that you're working with. It's also very important to seek out diverse perspectives. Do you have community experts that you can go to to discuss your case? Um, do you have folks that are directly impacted? Do you have po folks with uh, lived experiences that you can gain a, a deeper perspective from? Um, how can you create an open dialogue? How could you step into an uncomfortable conversation? Um, how could you build trust with the folks that you are representing? Um, when we think about uh, trauma-informed, um, we also have to think about how, particularly in that case of being, maybe the lawyer believed that they were being trauma informed and trying to hold back information to not um, pressure her her client. But in that case, um, it's more where you would wanna come from a healing centered approach. Um, we all often talk about client centered approach. What does it look like to come in knowing oh, I may have these implicit biases, so I need to have a dialogue with uh, the, the folks that I'm representing to ensure that I'm not holding this implicit bias. Um, you could have your, you know, ensure that you're practicing empathy um, and understanding that, you know, there's they have unique experiences. So how do I open up that dialogue to get to understand more? Um, and I think what's very important is just understanding the historical, structural inequities and the injustice that's already existing in this system. Um, I think if you lay that as your foundation, knowing that there is an injustice historically in this system, and how can I work to get out of that? 
um, in advocating, again, like I mentioned um, in response to that um, nonprofit industrial complex question, I think that we have to advocate because um, we are the ones that are doing that for, for our folks. We're the ones that are representing. Um, we have to advocate with our funders. We have to uh, advocate with um, legislators. We have to be the advocates and uplift those voices. So there's multiple ways that you can mitigate these. But I think that it starts with just like acknowledging that they exist, acknowledging that the system is unjust um, and laying that as the foundation and acknowledging that your the person that you are representing needs you to help advocate. Um, and those are just some strategies. Like I said, we'll also be leaving um, this toolkit that has um, some ways that you could scaffold your decision making, um, further readings and um, some short videos and things. So there's a ton of uh, materials for you to continue to do this work. Um, and ensure that you're 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 acknowledging your bias and uh, implicit bias, and you're you're mitigating it as much as possible. So I, I think I think we have about ten minutes left. So before we do our um, concluding takeaways, um, how about we open the floor to some a, a few minutes of questions or or comments um, from the audience. Um, and again, you can either write those in the chat or the Q&A functions, or um, you can unmute um, and speak out. Um, I'm sure there's um, plenty of um, implicit disagreement with at least something we, we've said during the course of this presentation. So don't feel any shyness of making that explicit. And um, one, one um, observation that I'll make while, while people are formulating their thoughts um, is um, another um, linguistic um, bias that's sort of baked into discourse, and that is the concept of law enforcement. So when we um, use the term law enforcement, that refers specifically uh, to the police and prosecutors. Um, it doesn't um, as ordinarily used, refer to, uh, for example, defense attorneys or civil rights advocates. Um, and, and that sort of use of the term sort of suggests that the law is on the side of those who are working for the repressive apparatus and order maintenance system, um, rather than on the side of those advocating for human and civil rights. Um, which is often not the case because it's often the police who are breaking the law, whether it be in the extreme versions of brutality um, or in the more, uh, uh, you know, um, white collar um, modes of um, biased prosecution practices. So even a term as routine and mundane as law enforcement in its um, selective application um, reflects a sort of bias um, in favor of a particular side of, of the existing system. I think we saw a hand um, pop up. Um, yes. Um, Lawrence, did you have a question or a comment? Oops. We, we, we might need to unmute. Um, Person, so if, if you raised your hand, uh, feel uh, encouraged to raise it again so that we can get you unmuted. Um, so. Okay, he raised his hand. Oh, hi. This is this is Alyssa. Actually, I'm I'm wondering about implicit bias as as it relates to um, our work and that we do it within um, the nonprofit industry. And and when we're advocating, are we at like how can we um, pinpoint our own implicit bias um, 
when when we're advocating for what we might think are the best practices for our for our people that we're mm -hmm. serving. Yeah. I think that um as you said, the last thing that you said is the people that we're serving. <laughs> so when we think about the 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 folks that we're serving, I think it's most important to not advocate based on what we believe that they need, but to ask them what is it that they need and help support them through the process of being able to um, advocate for themselves. So I think it's really important to not make assumptions around the needs of folks. Um, and I think that was the case in the scenario, right? Here's an assumption. Um, and I think that implicit bias in general is based off of like assumptions and prejudice. The word itself like is like prejudging or, you know, assuming. Um, so I think that opening it up um, and knowing that, you know, the folks that are the closest to the problem are typically closest to the solution. So really focusing on ways that you could co-create um, advocacy uh, with the folks that you're serving. Um, it's not like people don't need a hero, people need to be freed. So right. how can we do that? Um, and yeah, just ensuring that we're working with the folks that we're representing and not for them um, or, you know, it's with them. Mm -hmm. okay. And Rachel asked a great question around language. What is your preferred term for the criminal justice system? I don't use the justice word. I personally prefer the criminal legal system um, because the, uh, justice doesn't exist within the existing system. <laughs> and and my, my preferred term depends on context. So um, if, you know, assuming I'm not in a courtroom, I'll use the term uh, injustice system because I think that's the most um, accurate. And I, I don't think um, saying criminal legal system is, is it kind of like a euphemization. It, it's, it's kind it's kind of bland. Um, it doesn't, it's not going all the way in terms of um, calling it as you see it. So I, I would, my preferred term is injustice system, but um, obviously I'm not going to use that if I, if I'm, you know, in a courtroom. Um, I, I don't have a, a particular problem with using the term criminal justice system, as long as you have um, scare quotes around um around uh well all, all the terms in that in that phrase because um you know the, the conceptualization of crime is itself obviously a contestable social construct um you know justice is certainly a notoriously contested concept and even the extent to which you know the system how how exactly the system um is or is not systematic is something that um can be very um um, fraught as a conceptual matter. Um, and um, there's some instructions about um, CLE credit in the chat. Um, we'll also put our um, email addresses in the chat. Um, to wrap up, I'm going to give my um, takeaway points and then I'll pick, pick it back over to Tanisha for her um, concluding thoughts. Um, my, my takeaway points would be um, uh, be attentive to complex effects and unintended consequences of um, whatever um, decisions you're, you're you're making and policies and um, legal strategies that you're pursuing. Um, first and second, um, uh, don't assume that there's any outside of the prison and industrial complex um, or the network of carceral power, because in a certain sense, um, you know, even uh, the outside of the walls of carceral institutions are impacted by, by the system of carceral power. Yes. Uh, I think the overall takeaway is that the prison industrial complex is a network of institutions um, that has bled into uh, media and new age social media um, and that these biases can show up uh, a lot more often, especially when we start to think about the way that media is interacting with the way that we see the world 
Uh, so just being conscious, I think that is the main takeaway. Implicit bias is an unconscious decision that we're making. So how could we lean toward being more conscious in all areas of our life? We have to be conscious about being unconscious. Um, and we also need to recognize the way that biases show up as it relates to all protected classes and those classes that may not have that protection status yet. When we look at a person, it's not who they are, is not what they have uh, directly experienced. They are not a, a former convict, uh, what people will say, or inmate. These are people with incarceration experiences. Um, so it's important to understand their experiences, but we can't categorize them based off of all of their experiences because they are more than just, they are the sum total of all experiences. Um, so recognizing that, I think acknowledging it, taking time out um, and understanding when you have your confirmation biases, how could you exercise to get out of things that you have been taught um, to be able to better recognize the ways that uh, implicit bias shows up for you. Um, and also, I think that that last point of understanding the impact of the collateral consequences, right? Because just even in our scenario, this case that James went through, he will have to deal with for the rest of his life because of an implicit bias. Even once he gets out of prison, he is subjected to all of these consequences that will not allow him to get um, aid to go to school or live in a community um, that he prefers or to live in a house with the person that they love. Um, so just think about the ways that a very subtle implicit bias could have long-term consequences for a person, um, especially as it relates to uh, the ways that it shows up in a legal context. Um, I do see another question in there around, do you suggest wide surveys as a way to accrue needed base support in working with our incarcerated populations? Um, surveys are great. I think that intimate inquiry is also um, important and that's just interviewing because even when we create surveys, we are assuming what information that we can get um, instead of asking uh, open-ended questions to learn what information we may need. A survey kind of like sets you in a particular um, stage of answers that you're gonna receive. So surveys, yes, interviews even better, surveys with open-ended questions because sometimes we don't even know the information that we need to ask. Um, so surveys are important, but I would also leave them open um, to receiving, you know, information that you can't make an assumption of what you need to, what you're looking for. Um, so there is a follow up. Thank you. Yes, we're two minutes over. Thank you all for your time. Um, and Eric has dropped his email in the chat and I will um, leave this last slide with our information. Um, please feel free to reach out. I know you will receive a survey. Please uh, complete that survey. And thank you for joining us. And, and thanks to LAAC for um, coordinating this.